All right, I believe this is us for this evening. So we're going to jump right into this. If you haven't, has everybody been with us so far in this series? Okay, Don has not. So uh, we are in the series called Kingdom of Cults, and we are looking at some of uh, the, the more well-known and more common cults that we're going to find. We're going to look at their theology. They're going to look at some of their history. And then more importantly, we're going to look and see how do we counter them with Scripture, with the goal of seeing them saved. And so um, we're going we're gonna to kind of look at that. Three goals for this series that we've walked through. I've tried really hard. This isn't, this isn't so much a series of, hey, let's point out the faults in everybody else. Let's look at their aberrations and their unorthodox theology. My goal is to look and say, we need to understand them so we can win them. And that's the first thing, to reinforce in us a desire to see these people saved. That should be the propelling movement of why we're studying this is to give us info not ammunition so much as information on how to on how to share the gospel with people. The second thing is resource us with the tools we need to share Christ. That's that's uh, kind of what we've been talking about. And then we talked about this a little bit more the first week to refresh us on the gospel truths necessary to identify a counterfeit. Uh, a lot of these cults tonight, especially, we have to understand what a counterfeit looks like. And the only way we're going to do that is to know what the original looks like. If we want to see what true Orthodox Christianity looks like, we've got to search the scriptures. We've got to know the scriptures. The people that are often sucked into these kind of cult organizations are the ones who often don't know scripture and aren't, aren't very well trained in it. So uh, the, the defense that we have against that is to know the gospel and know the scriptures well. And so uh, that's, that's kind of what we've been what we've kind of been looking at as we as we have looked at this. Some key factors in identifying a cult. We've looked at this each week, and, and we're gonna run each cult that we go through through this kind of cult check. Uh, but we, I wanna look at these things. Now this doesn't mean every single cult will hit every single one of these items. This is just some typical things when you look at it. They tend to restrict the social life of their adherents. They don't want people to have a broad social life interacting with a lot of different people. They want people to be restricted often to their own members. And, and so that's a way of control so that you don't hear other ideas, you don't hear negative opinions, and you're, you're kind of, it's a, it's a, it becomes an echo chamber for, for their, their theology. And so that's typical. They usually have this, what we call an axis mundi, the center of the world is what that means in Latin. And it's usually a person at the center of the organization who is making all the decisions, who's the one in control. You often think about like the, the cults that are popular, uh, you know, like the, the, the one in Waco. There was a man, David Koresh, was, he was the axis mundi. What he said to his people was often scripture. Like they, they took it to be a, a divine revelation because often they are a shaman, uh, a person who is the intermediary between, between the supernatural and the natural world. These people often say things like, well, I have been given divine revelation, or I have uh, the, somebody, uh, an angel has visited me and given me special knowledge. And so they, they control people again through that. The third thing is manipulative control, manipulative and authoritarian mind control. Very, very common in cults. Uh, it's going to be, we're going to see that extensively tonight in the cult we're going to study. Uh, is, is control. They want to control every part of a person's life, and so that, that often happens. Uh, communal, anti-cultural organization. So many times, especially cults that were born in the 60s and 70s, they, they lived in communes. They, they left their homes, they cut ties with people, and they lived together in these communes. That's not so common today. Uh, but a lot of times you do see the idea of being anti-cultural, to be separate from culture, to live apart. Uh, you see this really heavily in Mormon theology today. Uh, you, you'll see uh, pockets in places in Utah that are still completely Mormon. I mean, if you go to Provo, it is, it is rare to find a person who is not a Mormon. And so they, they do tend to, to look at those kind of things. Aggressive proselytizing, that just means sharing their faith and trying to get people to sign up. It, proselytizing just means to uh, try to con try to make somebody switch from one religion to another, or one opinion or one belief to another. Um, again, proselytizing by itself is not a bad thing. We practice this as we share our faith. The difference is in the methods. We want to look at scripture and say, well, how does scripture instruct me to share my faith, not 
what is going to get the best results. And that's a lot of times what you'll see. And then a systematic program of indoctrination. And this is key because they want to get you in, but they want to keep you there as well. And so those are, those are some factors. That's not all of it. There's, there's many more. And, and some of these things, like tonight, our cult is not going to hit six out of six. There's going to be some things that are, that are not present here. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start this. I've got to tell you, I've studied a lot and I've preached a lot, but studying for this makes me feel very uncomfortable. I have read stories and watched documentaries and seen things and read blog posts and watched YouTube videos and it, like, there's nothing, there's nothing more soul crushing than to see someone lost and trapped in, in these kind of cults. And then worse, to see them come out of what I would consider a Christian cult is what we're going to look at today. Scientology, like we looked at last week, not a Christian cult. It's, it was just a cult. Today, this is a Christian cult. It's, it's, they're Christian in most doctrine, but cultish in most of their practice. But then to see people come out of it and then abandon Christianity completely because they've been lied to, they've been abused, and they've been manipulated. And I, So I, I'll say this, going into this study, it, this has been a lot harder to study than any other thing, just because I feel just so drained emotionally and spiritually every time we look at this. Uh, but we got to look at our, our goal is to see people, because I guarantee you today, you will know people inside this cult. Uh, maybe you don't know that you know them, or maybe you didn't know that it was a cult. Um, and we'll talk through it, but it is, it is definitely a cult, and we'll, we'll pray for them this evening. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the grace that we have in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you, you came and you lived the perfect life I could never live and died the death that I deserved. Jesus, you absorbed the wrath of God, and you satisfied it completely in order to offer me peace and reconciliation with the Father. I thank you for that, Lord, and I pray that this evening we would see your grace in the gospel. And Lord, if we know people in this trapped in this cult, I pray, Lord, that you would use us as instruments to bring them to true saving faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I love you and I thank you for the riches of peace and joy that we have in, in Jesus. And I pray that you would help us focus on that as we study uh, through this, these difficult topics. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's look at the United Pentecostal Church. Okay. I'm going to make some disclaimers tonight because what I'm not trying to do is cast dispersion on the word Pentecostal uh, or the word charismatic. We'll use them frequently. I'm not trying to do that. Um, but we need to look at this specific organization. When you see UPC or UPCI, those are... That's what specifically I'm talking about. But we're gonna, it's it's a broad group and, and we'll need to we'll need to go through it. One of the things is you will not find these beliefs shocking. So the last couple of weeks we've looked at some shocking things, especially in that first week. Uh, I really wish there was a camera on me. I really wish there would have been a camera on y'all's faces when we went through that first week. It was uh, it was really interesting. It was <laughs> really uh, just a, a shocking thing. This week is not the same. Last week we looked at Scientology, I mean, they believe that we're inhabited by extraterrestrial spirit beings and, and they need to be cleansed before they can travel to different universes. I mean, we're not going to see those kind of like shocking things. This is going to be, for the most part, when you look through the statement of faith, there's going to be 90% of it that you can say, I, I agree with that. But that 10% is the gospel. And they've completely missed it. And so we want to do that. There's not going to be any disappearances of top leadership. There's not going to be any really strange things that we've looked at in the last couple of weeks. No investigations by the government. This is not an organization that typically the IRS is, is looking into. It's not that kind of thing. Nobody is escaping this cult in the trunk of a car. You can leave. It's not easy, but it's, it's not like the other ones that we've looked at. But I believe out of all of the ones that we're going to look at in this entire series... I believe that the UPC is the most dangerous, the most dangerous one that we're going to see. And mostly because of its apparent proximity to Christianity. You're going to look at it and you're going to say, well, that doesn't sound too bad. They're only missing on a couple of things. But those couple of things are the key things. And when you miss them, you've missed the whole story of Christianity. And so it's, it's not the true gospel. And I believe that 
if people remain trapped in this, they're, they're bound for an eternity in hell. This is all around us. The UPC are all around us. There's no church in Van, but there's two in Canton, Mineola, Lindale, Grand Saline, Wills Point, and many in Tyler. So, guaranteed, you will, you will meet someone, or you may know someone, and, and, and I will say this, I run the risk, especially of, of doing one so close to home, of offending people tonight. And, and that's obviously, I hope you know, not my intention. If you say, hey, my best friend goes to a UPC church, what are you trying to say? I, I want to point you through their doctrine. I want to point you through what they claim on their own uh, website and statements of faith, and I want you to see how dangerous this can really be. So let's look at a couple of things. The history of the UPC. They were officially founded in 1945, but they did exist before that. Its headquarters, uh, headquarters are in Hazelwood, Missouri. And I'm so happy that we finally found a cult that wasn't started in California. I'm very glad that we found one. A good Midwestern cult is, is what we were looking for for a while. They claim on their website, again, that, uh, we talked about Scientology last week. Uh, they claim to have 5 million adherents worldwide, but that number is probably inflated. I don't know about this one as well. They claim to have 42,000 churches with 5.3 million members in 197 countries. So that is, I mean, that's a, this is quite an extensive organization. It is, it is very big. Uh, it was founded, like I said, 1945. But to understand the, the history of it, we're going to go back a little further, and we're going to study the history of the Pentecostal movement, because that's where it was born out of. And again, I, I am not here to uh, cast wide dispersion dispersions on people. If you grew up in, in Pentecostal theology or in charismatic church, uh, my goal is not to not to offend you. I'm just going to give you the facts, and, and we're going to kind of talk through uh, some of that. So let's talk about some of these some of these early men. This was born, like I said, out of the Pentecostal movement. The Pentecostal movement is not old. Uh, you know, there are many churches who have existed for hundreds of years. Um, some, I mean, the Catholic Church can claim more like a thousand years or more. However, the Pentecostal movement, so when you talk about like the Assemblies of God, um, the, the Church of God in Christ, and some of those, uh, they, they're not old. This movement started in the early 1900s, so it's only about 120 years old. It started, I, I get, like I said, I'm going to be careful, because I'm not trying to associate every Pentecostal and every Charismatic with, with this church, but it started with a group of people who came and, and became popular teachers, and largely because they started to teach something new. And if we've learned anything throughout Christian history, people love new things. One of my favorite quotes from John MacArthur is, if you found something new in Scripture, you are most decidedly wrong. Because there's not anything new. God is not going to reveal new things to his people. He, he has revealed what he has revealed in his word, and that's, and that's what we're going to we're going to look at. Uh, so Pentecostalism started in the early 1900s, and, and it started with the teaching of a few of these men uh, that, that we're going to look at. This is Charles Fox Parham, and uh, he was an important figure in, in Pentecostalism. We'll talk about him. This is William Seymour, and he's probably the key figure because he was the one who began the Azusa Street Revivals, which we'll talk about as, as the really the start of the Pentecostal movement. And this is John Schlepp. Um, he, he was the one who really founded the United Pentecostals in, 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 in that vein. So three men, um, I, I, I get this is history, and so you're like, I don't understand or don't like history. That's okay, but we've got to understand where these people came from. And so uh, these, these are some important people. 1900 to 1905, Charles Fox Parham, he, he preached. And, and William Seymour preached 1906. He started in, in Azusa Street in, in Los Angeles. All of them had the same thing. They came from the same place where they began to teach that God had given them special revelation. So all of them came with this idea that God has visited me in a vision or in a dream or in some kind of extra biblical way and given me specific knowledge to reform the church today. And so that, that's where all of these men started. When you do that, church, when you say God has told me something specific, and he spoke it to me, and he meant it just for me. When you do that, you can do and say anything that you want. And who can challenge you? Because who is going to challenge somebody who goes up and says, God told me to say this or to do this? Because then you look awful. But the truth is, when someone says that, really, the first thing we should say is, chapter and verse. Show me it in Scripture. 
Because God spoke through scripture, and that's how he wanted to communicate to his people. So these people taught things, and because often when someone comes and says, God has given me a divine revelation, typically it's something that is not taught in scripture, and they want, they want to propagate this, this kind of theology. And so, again, you can create any doctrine you want when you just say, God spoke to me. And often in churches, we're not, we, don't, we don't challenge that. We should be challenging that, but we don't because we don't want to be like, well, if God really did speak to him, what are we going to say? And then they'll come back and say, well, you're putting God in a box to say that he only communicated through his word. And, and, and there's a debate that can go back and forth on this. But Charles Parham, he was really the first one to teach that the sign gifts in the New Testament were still in effect today. He was really the first one. So for many, many hundreds of years, the church believed with relative uniformity that the sign gifts, the healings, the tongues, and all of these things had ended with the death of John the Apostle. That, that they were given to the church uh, through the apostles at a very specific point in time to validate a message. And then when the, when the scripture was completed, that, that those were no longer necessary because we had the word of God in its complete form. And so he was the first one, really, to start saying, all these sign gifts are, are in effect today. And what happened is that he became known for doing healings. And so he was one of the first to, to be one of those traveling, uh, you know, faith healers. And, and so that's, that's where he got his start. I'll be, I'll be honest, okay? I'm, I'm not going to, if I offend you it, 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 at this point, it's too late. The Pentecostal movement, I think, has done a lot of damage. To, to the church as a whole. Their obsess, obsession with the, the gifts of the Spirit to the exclusion of so much else has, has in many, many places, I'm not saying every church, but has caused a lot of damage and a lot of misunderstanding among, among Christians. And so this, this right here, this man, Charles Parham, I think he did a, he did a lot of, of damage. His protege was William Seymour. William Seymour went to Los Angeles and began to preach in, uh, in a place called, on a place called Azusa Street. And a revival broke out there. And so many charismatics, if you talk to Assemblies of God, if you talk to Church of God, you'll see them all point to the same thing. They'll, they'll, they'll revere what happened there at Azusa Street in 1906. Um, what happened, in, and this was the birthplace of the tongues movement. People began speaking in tongues, and you'll even see this is from the uh, Los Angeles Daily Times, and the headline says, Weird Babble of Tongues. New sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Uh, that was 1906, when they, they started to see these things. Uh, here's a, a picture of what was happening there, and I, I don't know if you can see it or not, but a lot of it, you're seeing ecstatic movements. So this is the beginning of, you'll see today like when Benny Hinn is on TV, he'll go out among the crowd and, and wave his coat and people will just fall down and they'll be slain by the spirit uh, or, or he'll, he'll pop them on the head and then they'll fall and they'll shake. The, those are kind of the, the things that, that are, are typical of, of some of these hyper charismatic churches today and it all started here in, in the Azusa Street revivals. I'll be honest with you, church, that is, that is not, there is nowhere in scripture that says that you will be uh, shaken by the spirit or slain by the spirit or cast down to the ground and, and, and foam at the mouth. Many of the things that we see today in some of these churches and some of these instances are, are things that in the Bible look more like demonic possession than they do a Christian, a Christian thought. Uh, the, the Bible talks about God as the God of order. He's not going to create chaos among his church. And I think that's, that's where some of this has gone. So Azusa Street, though, thousands and thousands of people came. And they heard this message. And they began to speak in tongues. And they did all of these different things. And, and, and that's where many of the branches uh, went and, and started after that. Uh, the other man, I'll go back. The other man, John Shep. He, uh, he was the first one to start teaching Jesus' name only theology, and we will talk about that here in a little bit, and that's where that's where we started here. But the Azusa Street Revival, this is where kind of everything began um, there. I, I wish I had time. I, I'm going to recommend two books to you, and I would love for you to write these down if you're looking for a more history on this. Uh, John MacArthur wrote both of these books. The first one, it was his earlier book, it was called Charismatic Chaos. Charismatic Chaos, I think it was written like 1983, 
or something like that. And then the second one is also by John MacArthur, and it's called Strange Fire. If you want to know more, you want to see more, he's done extensive research into this. I'm just giving you a preview of where this started. Now, from, from this beginning, many, many little bitty groups and denominations began to stream out from, from these different places, from uh, where Charles Parham taught and then also from Azusa Street. Some of these streams, like the Assemblies of God was created in 1916, okay? It is a very broad denomination. I was very good friends with the Assemblies of God preacher in, in Clayton, New Mexico, and I consider him a brother in Christ. And so I, I think he's wrong on a couple of things, but I, I'm, I consider him a brother in Christ. Where the United Pentecostal Church, where they veered, I will not. I will not consider them my brother in Christ because of some of the differences in theology. But I do want you to see this. Every single leader in all of these early Pentecostal movements, every single one, was disgraced or discredited at some point in, in their ministry or career. So it, it's, it's, it's a very scary founding when you think of every single one. So Charles Parham went, uh, came to Texas. <laughs> uh, thank goodness for that. Um, he came to the Promised Land and he still didn't didn't get his life right. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, but he came to Texas and then he was uh, involved in many different things and he was tried in Texas for sodomy and for indecency with his young assistant J.J. Jordan. His reputation, he was, he was acquitted of it because they couldn't find proof, but he, his reputation never, never recovered. He never preached uh, again after, after that. Uh, There's other ones that fell in sex scandals. There was others that fell in financial and fraud schemes. They, they stole a lot of money from different people and, and, um, and, and different things like that. Uh, there was a group that came out of the Azusa Street Revival, and they were speaking in tongues, and they were so excited, and they said, we're going to go to China, and we're going to be missionaries because we don't have to learn the language. God has given us you know, the glossolalia, the, the, the ability to speak in another tongue. And they went to China, and they came back in six months utterly disgraced, when they found out that they were not speaking a real language. And, and, they, and I, I'm saying they genuinely did not know that. They did not know that they were speaking gibberish, and they came back, and, and it, was a, it was a big deal because people had sent them there, and it was going to be the next big missionary movement. And, and I think today, even when you think about it, the fact that we have Pentecostal language schools is, is an irony that I, I don't understand. Because if God has given them the ability to speak in a language, because when you see in Scripture, when someone speaks in the word tongue, it, it's that word glossa, which is tongue, but it always is talking about a physical, earthly language. Always. There, there's not a mention of, of somebody speaking in uh, an angelic language. There's one time Paul talks about, if I speak with the tongue of men or angels, but he's not talking about it as to do this, we're never talked about a private prayer language. We, we, there's, there's no instance of that. It is always a real language. And in each and every situation, it was given for a very specific reason, either, either to share the gospel with a person from a different country or to edify the church. And so I've never been part of, of a charismatic service where tongues were spoken, where it was following the pattern of Scripture that Paul laid out in the book of 1 Corinthians. We were at a church in, on a mission trip one time in Honduras. And we didn't, we didn't know what kind of church it was. And so we just we went because we were looking for a, a Sunday night church. And it was interesting. We were a, a very conservative Southern Baptist church. And so you can only imagine some of the people watching, people being slain in the spirit. People falling and shaking and their eyes rolling back in their heads. And all of these things. Tongues, people shouting in different languages, shouting over each other. And the, our, my group of teenagers, oh, I wish you would have seen their faces. I mean, just white, ashen face like, I don't know what to do in this situation. And so afterwards, uh, a woman got up and said she had a prophecy for us. And she looked at our group and she says, I'm sensing a lot of doubt in this, in this area. And we, and we were like, yeah, uh, there's a little bit of doubt. And she said, well, this, God gave me a word that you will all dream a dream tonight, and you'll dream the same dream, and it will confirm everything that you've spoken. 
And so honestly, church, I went to bed that night hoping. I went to bed thinking, maybe if, if, if we do, then I was wrong on all of this, and I'm willing to do that and to say that. But we dreamed separate dreams. Nobody had the same. And we got up this morning, we all compared. Some people didn't dream at all. Some people dreamed about weird, dumb things. Some people dreamed uh, serious things. We went back and forth and we talked about it, and nobody did. And so to me, I look at that and I say, if somebody has spoken in, in the name of God and said, God gave me this, and it was not, then that person is a false prophet. And so I, I look at that, and, and that, but that is, that is very common in churches that say, well, the, the, the spirit, you can't put the spirit in a box. You'll, you'll do all of these things. So all of that was born. All of these people, all of these people were disgraced and discredited. That is not the start, especially for a, a denomination or, or a movement that preaches holiness to their extent. There have been some of the biggest unholy scandals. All the TV preachers that you see, uh, Benny Hinn and all of them, at some point have had some kind of scandal. And it's... I think that's very telling of, of the organization as a whole. But I want to talk specifically, sorry, I went too long on that. I want to talk specifically about the UPC. So let's, let's talk about that. Because they, a lot of these little groups, you know, kind of went, and some of them came together, and some were bigger, some were smaller. Two of the bigger ones came together in 1945. The Pentecostal Church Incorporated and the Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ. And they formed the United Pentecostal Church. Now I want to talk about something specific. Let's talk about their beliefs. There's, there's a lot of different places that we could find points of contention and contrast, but there's one uh, key, key thing that we have to see inside this organization, and this is the first one on your list, is this oneness theology. That's the first specific belief or key term, oneness theology. Church, if you see this, you've got to run. Oneness theology is so, so dangerous. I believe that this is the dividing line between a person who, is, who possesses the true gospel and someone who doesn't. So the UPC teaches oneness theology. We also call this modalism. That's, that's the, kind of our, our theological term for it. They teach that there is no trinity. That, that there, is, there is no trinity of, of three. There, there is one God, obviously, that we, that we serve. But he eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. So they do not. They believe that he switches roles through time. So he was the Father in eternity past. He became the Son during the earthly life of Christ. And now he exists as the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't exist simultaneously. He is. He, he takes on roles as they go. So right now there is a Holy Spirit, but there is no Jesus. Jesus is, is not in existence right now because it is only Holy Spirit. When Jesus was alive, there was no Holy Spirit. There was no Father. He is, he is Jesus. Um, you, I'm sure right now you can think of several Bible verses to refute that theology. They have never given a, a solid rebuttal to it. And in fact, one of the things I'm going to give you, uh, if you haven't grabbed one already, is this. It's a couple of pages. It's four pages. So I know it's a lot of text and it's kind of small, but this is 10 questions to ask of one people who believe this oneness theology, and, and it's all the scripture to, to refute each and every one of the things. Like, for example, where in the scripture does it say that God is unitary, which means one? And they'll come back and they'll say, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Again, a verse out of context, because that's not talking about God as Unitarian, that's talking about God in his essence. There's one, one divine God, one, one eternal being that is God. But he exists in three persons, and so that's, that's the difference. And so you'll see there's, there's ten, ten uh, points on here, and there's a lot, a lot of scripture. I'd love to, uh, for you, you to take one of these home uh, with you, but they've never given a good defense, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So this oneness theology, he was old, he, in the Old Testament he was father, in the New Testament he was son, and now he is, he is the spirit. Uh, this is a rejection of orthodox theology. I mean, you cannot, as we consider it today, you, you are not an orthodox Christian by rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity. It is, I mean, it, it was written, the, the, the Trinity isn't a doctrine that we came up with 
at some point and said, maybe this is a good idea. It's pulled straight from Scripture. And they will look and say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. That's, that's a very popular argument. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible. So if you're going to take that, I mean, you could say that about a lot of different things. But we're going to look at a, a Scripture that is very clear when it, when it talks about that here in a little bit. But they've rejected Orthodox theology from the beginning. The Apostles' Creed teaches a Father, a Son, and a Spirit existing co-eternally. So, the second thing we're going to talk about, so that's oneness theology. This is their biggest problem. I could stop there and say, right there, we just haven't got to why they're a cult yet. This is just aberrant theology. The second thing is this, Jesus only. Jesus only. Which is ironic, because Jesus, to them, does not exist right now. Uh, how many of y'all, and you may not want to cop to this or, or raise your hand, but have you heard or you read or watched the movie The Shack? Okay, so that's, that, is, that is modalism, that is oneness theology, that's how they present God, that he appears in different ways, to different people, in different forms, that, that's exactly what this is. Um, and so, I, I will beg you, please do not recommend it to me. You'd be surprised at how a lot of church members come and say, you need to read this book. Um, I have, and, it, and, it's, and it's not good. I'll stop there. I, I, I feel like I'm offending so many people tonight, so we're, we're just going to keep moving on. It's kind of your job. It is kind of my job, a little bit, yeah, to uh, to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's that's what I've always heard. Uh, so baptism, Jesus only. The UPC, this is really unique in their church, but they believe that people should only be baptized in Jesus' name. Not in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Just in the name of Jesus. In fact, they have a very specific formula the words have to be said to make it a legitimate baptism. A, a very specific thing. And this came straight out of John Shep. John G. Shep, he was the first one to teach this. He believed that God had spoken to him in a vision and given them and said, you must baptize in Jesus' name only. Uh, I, I, again, I, I think you could probably come up with a verse right off the bat where Jesus himself told us literally the opposite. What did he say? Matthew 28, 19. All power is given unto me. Go into all the world, make disciples, teach, uh, and then what do you say? Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all these things that I've commanded you. So, I, I, again, they don't give responses to this. They will look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, where it says that, that, that people were baptized in Jesus' name. That didn't mean that they were baptized in Jesus' name only. It just means that that was the only name that was that was provided in that in that situation. But this is, it, it's beyond this because it talks about their baptism as a whole. So they believe that uh, any baptism done differently, if, if you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, you are not a believer. You are not baptized. You are not legitimately baptized. So that's, that's one point. They believe that only a licensed UPC minister can legitimately baptize a person. So, how many in here have been baptized by a legitimately licensed UPC person, or minister? So, none of you are saved in, in this. Jesus was not. <laughs> Jesus was not. So, I mean, that's, that's where I want you to see. Right off the bat, they would look at you and say, you are not going to heaven. You do not possess, regardless of your saving faith in Christ, you do not possess the credentials necessary to enter heaven. The third thing is they believe that a legitimate baptism will cause a person to speak in tongues. That that's the sign of a, a true salvation is the utterance of tongues. So if you don't speak in tongues, that means you were not really saved. That's their evidence for it. I watched a video this week about a young man who was baptized eight times and he never spoke in tongues, and finally the last time, he admits to this on, on this YouTube video, he says, I had to make up, and he said, I just had to talk baby language so that they would believe me, so that I could be part of the church. I mean, this is, this is the level of control. So that's three things that they say you have to do. You have to be baptized by a, 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 a credentialed minister. You have to be baptized in Jesus' name only. You have to be, so you have to speak in tongues. What that teaches you is that they've put now three conditions on the gospel. Three things that you have to do, which means that they believe in baptismal regeneration. That means that this process of salvation is not complete until these three conditions are met. 
That's that's dangerous. That's that is not the true gospel. Uh, what they are what they're teaching in this. Uh, it also means that they're works based. That you have to do things in order to be legitimately saved. So right there, that is to me that is. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, if anyone comes and preaches to you a different gospel than the one that I brought, this is Paul speaking, then let him be accursed. I mean, that's, that's, I think this is exactly what's happening. I do not, I do not believe that, that a person lost in this theology is genuinely saved. Now, can someone be genuinely saved inside this theology? Yes, absolutely. If they hear the gospel presented, and they believe in their heart that Jesus died and rose again, and, and they confess it with their mouths, then that, that is, that's, that's the conditions. That's it. There's nothing humanly that we can do. It is all the work of God. And so, But I would hope and I would pray that a person genuinely saved would and could not stay inside this church. In the same way I would say that about the Catholic church. I would say if a person is genuinely saved inside the Catholic church, and I have met people I believe to be, then... The gospel message and the word preached to them should should propel them to leave that that bad theology. So this this you see what I mean. But I have to be so clear about this because it's so dangerous. It is it's wrapped in Christian language and theology to a degree that you would read this and say, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. But then when you look at those two things, that they reject the Trinity and they reject a, a, a salvation by grace through faith alone. I mean. You're, we're getting slim pickings on what they've actually got right at this point. The last thing is this, and I want to I cover a lot here, uh, holiness. Um, they don't corner the market on holiness. They just use this phrase interchangeably with obedience to the church. Okay? They, they will say holiness is this. Now, let's talk about us. If I said the word holiness, what would you, how would you define that? I know it's a really broad term. Set apart. Set apart. That's exactly what that means. Set apart. So, in the in the in the instance of a person, what would it mean to be holy? Don't say just say set apart. Let's peel that up. He's like, I'm using biblical language, man. You gotta give it to me, which is the truth. Trying to be Christ-like, somebody that really, really tries hard to, sure. to do what God calls them to do, knowing that it's not in our power. Yeah. We can't we can't be Christ, right. or we can't even really be Christ-like without the work of the Spirit yeah. sanctifying these people. Yeah. And, and, and so holiness, I, I mean, it looks like a lot of different things. Uh, what 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 you consider holiness in, in one place of your life is probably a little different than later on. But because it's such a broad term, like John said, it's set apart, set apart from the world, not looking like the world, looking more like Christ. We we would put those kind of descriptions on it. The UPC, they, they put a whole different level. They have a very strict code of behavior. I mean, there's points. There's a there's, there's hundred points of theology and doctrine where they say, you must do these things and this makes you holy. And that is a very different gospel than what we teach. Every part of a person's life, and this is a general term because maybe some churches are, are less controlling, maybe some churches are more, but every part of a person's life in the UPC is controlled by the church. They determine what you can wear, um, and that's that's pretty common in, in Christians. They, they especially they've hung up on, on women wearing pants. That's that's a big thing. They, they cannot. They have to wear a skirt. I watched a, a long, I watched this long video about a woman uh, who hadn't worn pants for like the first 23 years of her life because she had grown up in the UPC, and then the first time she tried on pants was in a Goodwill, and she cried in the dressing room because she felt so shameful that she was. And that's, that's the level of control you see. They want to control. Uh, women cannot cut their hair. Cannot, a, the pair of scissors cannot touch your hair. So often you will see them with hair, I mean, down to their back or, or lower, and they usually keep them in buns because that's a lot of hair to keep up with. And so I talked to Mindy a little bit about this um, because I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I had heard it was so that we could take it and uh, dry Jesus' feet after they Interesting. I, I think that. That's why women were supposed to not cut their hair. That's, I mean, that's, and again, that's so extra biblical, but it sounds so poetic that to say, no, I don't believe that, might make you look awful. Who wouldn't want to, you don't want to drive Jesus's. But that was, that, that's not what that, that story was about. That was her preparing him for his 
for his death and burial. So they cannot, and uh, and that's a that's I mean that's that was a big thing for a lot of the people, especially the women who came out of it that I've read their stories this week. A lot of them focus in on that 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 our hair it, it was meant to be because there's verses in, in First Corinthians that talk about a woman's hair as her glory, and so uh, they felt they felt shameful and dirty when they finally did get their their hair cut, and so um, that's a big part of it. Um, the and then, minister. And then you have the, the Jews who they you know they completely shaved their heads when they and wear wigs. Uh huh. I mean that's so different interpretations of the of the same <laughs> the same <laughs> ideas. It's it's really interesting. Uh, one big one is the is, is the level of control of the pastor, in the minister in each congregation. I mean, a a scary level of control. In in many of the stories that I've read this week, he controls how much you give to the church. So instead of you determining in your heart what, what you might give or not give, the pastor comes and says, I think you're a 25% giving family. I think you're a 15%. I, I think this. And, and they, I mean, really, you're, you're peer pressured or, or intimidated into doing what, what he wants. Um, marriages must be approved by the pastor. You cannot choose who you want to marry. It has to go through him. You have to go and say, we're wanting to get married and he has to say yes or no. Uh, some of the ones we're talking about, they couldn't buy a vehicle unless they came to the pastor and said, this is the vehicle we want. Do you approve of this? And he might say no. And then you have to go and start looking again. This is that, but that's the level of control. And this is where we start to get really into this cult-like behavior about controlling every single part of a person's life. And that's just a, it's a, it's a power thing. It's an authority thing. It's, I, I, I don't want you to live your life. I want... I want to, to be the one who directs all of your actions. So all of these things, where you go to college, what career you're going to have, often was dictated by the pastor instead of by the person. This is so dangerous. I am not the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that's the difference is that they've confused the work of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit should be the one. As you walk in fellowship and you walk in step with the Spirit, he guides your actions. So when you come and you say, I don't know, I, I, should I go to this college? You can go to the Spirit and ask Him, and, and maybe He will, maybe He'll direct you. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I, I, to me, I, all of those kind of things. I think He gives you also a brain in your head and gives you natural wisdom and supernatural wisdom to know what to do. I, and if somebody came to me and said, "Hey, what college should I go to?" That's a big question to ask. I mean, that's the a lot of determining what you're going to do and where you're going to go. That's not fair, and I don't want that responsibility. I can tell you what I think, but I'm not going to speak in the name of God for something that Scripture didn't talk about. And so that's this is, again, very dangerous. And the fact that they wrap all this under holiness. So when a person begins to question some of these ideas, what do you think gets said about them? Yeah, yeah, maybe you're not saved. If you're questioning these things... Yeah, maybe you're not saved. Uh, the first thing they're going to attack is your holiness. Well, you're you're being you're a backslider. That's the one of the top things that people said is that they were accused of being backsliders. If you question the pastor, you must be backsliding. And so again, this is manipulation. It's authoritarianism and it's control. Um, oh, I don't want to go that far yet. I'll just leave it there though. Let's run this through a cult check, um, and we'll see. There's more we could talk about, but I want to I want to be I want to get fit through with this. Uh, do they restrict the social life of their members? Yes, absolutely. They are told to cut ties uh, with uh, family members. They're told to, uh, to stay away from certain people if they question the, the teachings of the church. They're told to hang around and only uh, be around the people. Uh, the girl that I, I read her story, uh, she was encouraged from the time that she was a little kid, you will only hang around with our group, you will only hang around with our kids, ministry in, in high school, if you're thinking about marrying someone, you will only marry somebody from this church. And so uh, even then, when you when you go to date someone, you obviously cannot date in this. It's, it's considered unholy. And so you court when you're old enough, and you cannot hold hands. Uh, you definitely cannot kiss. That is, that is aberrant. That is unholy. Uh, and they want to reserve all of that for marriage. Now, do I disagree with a lot of that? No. I, if my daughter never kissed a guy, I would be I'd be super happy. Uh, <laughs> that way I would never have to consider punching or worse to anybody. However, I also know that, that, that that's unrealistic. Now, my goal is to promote 
a, a spirit of purity. Holiness by way of walking with Jesus and looking and saying, Jesus, how can I please you and how can I obey your word? Not holiness in the sense of following this list of rigorous regulations and that makes me holy. I, I don't want that. And so that's, that's scary. But yes, they restrict the social life of their members in, in spades. Uh, do they have an axis mundi controlling everything? This is really interesting because this is the first time it's been a little different. Before, there's been one person controlling the entire organization. That is not the case. They do have a, a president. They do have you know district supervisors. But the Axis Mundi is church to church. That man who is the minister or the pastor of a church, he is he is the Axis Mundi. So it looks a little different because there are if there's 42,000 churches, there's 42,000 centers of the universe. And, and so often, now you will find them that aren't like this. Maybe there are some with a genuine heart to serve. But what I, as, as I've studied, it, is, it has not been that case. Many of these churches are, are, are following in that same uh, footsteps. And if you question this man, you are, they, they go back to touch not the Lord's anointed. You, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should, this man is the man of God. In fact, in one story, a horrible, heinous story that I read, a youth pastor had raped an 11 year old girl at a youth event. And she had gone and told her parents. The parents came to the, this was like 1980. It, the, the protocols were a little different. Uh, and, and so it wasn't common to see, or maybe it was common, it just wasn't public. But they came and the pastor of that church met with her, the family and the youth pastor. And they made the accusation and the pastor looked at the youth pastor and said, did you do it? And the youth pastor said, no. And so he looked at that family and said, it's your word against his, and he is a man of God. And so that man left the church pretty quick after that, because he knew you can't stay in a place like that. And the same thing happened in the next church. And it became a, a trail of devastation, and finally it, it came back to him in 2019. He went on trial because enough people had spoken up, and, and he finally confessed to it. Got 20 years in prison, and they deferred 18 of those years, and so ended up serving two years, and he is out now, and he is actively seeking and in the process of being credentialed as a minister in this organization again. So these are the kind of things I'm telling you. That the support that he had at his trial, there's pictures and video at his trial, and he had confessed to it, but his church was there and, and in support of him. And, and voice that support. And that's the kind of thing. This is, a, this, this is a cult. When you can see evil and you can say, but dot, dot, dot. Now, in, in, in a situation, in, especially in, a, in a, an organization where women are treated like this, where they're treated like we're controlling every part of you. You're, we're controlling who you can be around. We're controlling what you can wear. Uh, we're controlling all of these things. We're controlling your, your very body in terms of your hair. In that, 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 that breeds abuse. That's, that's exactly what that is for, men to have power over women. So, yes, Axis Mundi, and it, is, and it is terrifying. You read some of these stories, and it is tragic. And it, 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 it bothers me quite a bit that there, there's a lot we could, we could talk about there. Uh, do they practice manipulative control? <laughs> Absolutely. This is, they, they probably cornered the market on, on this. Do they tend to live in communes or shared spaces? This is the one we would say no. They, they do not. Um, they, they, do, uh, they, they tend to restrict their social life of their people, but you, you can live anywhere, and, and there are churches everywhere. Um, do they aggressively proselytize? Yes, they, they do that. Again, though, no, no more so than we would. Uh, it's, it's, I, I would say I would love everybody to aggressively proselytize. Probably be biblical about it, though, and not... You know, don't don't go to the mall and and get people to purchase things and then use that information to to get them to come to church. That's a that's a scary way. Do they indoctrinate people? Yes. You'll see psychological trauma for years and years after people leave this organization, where the the trauma of if it causes you to break down when you try on pants in a store because of how many years you've been told how ungodly that was. That's a, that's a scary thing. Um, I will say this. This was very popular, though, even among independent Baptists. So Mindy grew up where she could not wear pants. And they moved to Iowa when she was like 11, 12. And it's, I mean, they had two feet of snow. And so finally, Mindy's mom went to Mindy's dad and said, I am allowing them to wear snow pants. And Mindy's dad said, Marilyn, like that, 
you're going to allow them to wear pants? And she said, yes, there are, there's three feet of snow outside, and I'm going to allow them to wear pants. And so after that, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an issue. But again, that shows you the level of, we take things that are not in Scripture, we make them as important as Scripture, and then we confuse people uh, with, with, with a lot of this. So uh, five out of six, I, I, this is a cult. Um, you, may, you may disagree, and you may look and say, I know some good guys that are in this. Uh, I, would, I would encourage you to share the gospel with them and, and pray that they would leave an organization like this. Uh, if you try to leave, you are shunned by their community. You are, you are cut off. Uh, they will not speak to you. Uh, they, they will write you off. Um, like I said, many people struggle with years of, of guilt and psychological trauma. There's countless stories of abuse and manipulation on the part of uh, pastors and ministers. This is, this is a cult. Now let's answer their claims. Um, just a couple of things I want to see because I feel like this one is really easy. Uh, there's some that I don't even like Scientology. I don't even know where to start. Like, how do you counter something so wackadoodle? But this it, this seems like they have some of their beliefs are just so apparent and so on the surface uh, that that it's uh, I find this a little bit easier. Uh, so this teaching started in in 1900s. The, the teaching of Jesus only. That's where I want to start. Uh, John Shep claimed that God gave him a vision and told him to baptize in Jesus' name. Like I said, uh, when you make a claim like this, that Jesus told me and, and he gave me this special revelation, you can say anything you want, it, it directly counteracts the, or contradicts the, the message of Jesus. So Jesus commanded his church to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. If you want to write that down, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. That is, to me, the most basic way. I, I don't know how they would how they would get around that. I know they would point us to uh, Acts chapter 3 and say, well, uh, Peter said to baptize in Jesus' name only, but he didn't. He just said he baptized in Jesus' name. He didn't say that he baptized in Jesus' name only. So that's, that's a contradiction there. Um, really want to hit oneness theology, though. This, this one is, is interesting to me. This is just an absolute refusal to plainly read and obey Scripture. I mean, the scripture is very clear from the very beginning. God speaks in Genesis chapter 3, and then again in Genesis chapter 6, in, in, in plural language. He speaks in, in and of himself. He's speaking as the Trinity to one another. He says, let us make man, well, let us make man in our image. And so, again, from the, from the very beginning, you'll see this all the way through, there, there is the, the teaching there. Now, the word Trinity is not in Scripture. We, see, we saw that. But the, the idea is there. But the key to me, there's a couple of them. John 1.1. 1, 1. You may know this one. You probably don't need to turn there. In the beginning was the Word, the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. was God. And so who is the Word? Jesus. Jesus. So right there, we've learned that the Word, Jesus, was with God at the beginning and what's God? <clears throat> That's a contradiction of oneness theology, how, how they interpret that. The key, though, for me, as I look through all of the different passages that talk through the Trinity, is Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I don't know how they would get around this. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, the heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw what? The Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Church, what does that doctrine teach? What is this, or what doctrine does this teach? Trinity. This is the Trinity. I don't know how you would look past this. This is the Son being blessed by the Father and, 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 and touched by the Spirit. This is all three Persons of the Trinity existing simultaneously, and so they would argue a couple of things against that. They would say, well, Jesus was God in this moment, and as God, he can send a representation of his spirit in, and, and do that at the same time. Again, that's, that's theological gymnastics. We're bending backwards to try to avoid saying something that Scripture is very plain on. And the, the epistles later on, but Paul talks about it, Peter talks about it, everybody talks uh, about God as, as three. That, that Paul gives a blessing, we just studied in 2 Thessalonians, he gives the blessing of 
the Father, the Son, and the Spirit at the same time. And so, but this right here, Matthew 3, 16, 17, that's, to me, that's, that's David's stone in the sling. That is how, how I would effectively look at this, because they, they don't have an answer to that. Uh, they have a couple of arguments that they use to support their view. Uh, they argue, like I said, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Um, but again, there's a lot of words that aren't in the Bible that are biblical, like the word Bible. Um, there are hundreds of references, they say, to God being one in the Bible. The God is one. We affirm that. We affirm. We do not believe in three gods. We, we believe in one God who eternally exists in three persons. And to wrap your mind around that is not, not possible. We're not going to effectively understand how that how that can be, but also this is one of the areas that we, we see it in Scripture, and we believe it because it is because it is there. Uh, but He ex exists eternally in three distinct persons: Father, Son, and Spirit. When the Bible talks about God's exclusivity, that He is one, it's not talking about solitude; that He is alone. It, it, it just talks about that there is one God, and so we agree that you know we affirm that there's one God, but they're misunderstanding what that means. Uh, then the third thing is they use John 10.30. That's their big proof text. So where mine would be Matthew 3, 16, 17, theirs is John 10.30, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That's their, that's their big, that's their, what they consider, you know, their, how, how are you going to beat this one? But again, that's a misunderstanding of that word. That word one doesn't mean we are the same person, because also in that same passage, he talks to God. He talks to the Father. So who is he talking to? He is, literally would be talking to himself. In that, in that specific instance, when he says, I and the Father are one, he's talking about one essence. We are both divine. We are both God. Uh, it, the book of Colossians says he is the image of the invisible God. He is it, the fullness of, of God dwells in Jesus Christ. We're the same essence. He's saying, I'm not different than the Father. I'm not, there's not a God and then I'm kind of a lesser God over here. I am God in the same way that the Father is. And so th that's a misunderstanding of, of the word that he's saying we share the divine nature. We are, we are both co-equal and co-eternal. And so there's a lot. I, I really would love for you, I made 10 copies, hopefully that's enough one for each family, uh, but take these home. These are, this is great. This has a lot of stuff to think through. Um, different scriptures to think about. Um, it, it talks about, like, number three, if God is Unitarian, why are there so many plural descriptions of God? Number four, if God is Unitarian, why are there so many places in the Bible where the Father, Son, and Spirit are clearly distinguished from one another in the same verse? Like, these are some real, real ways. If you know somebody in this, in this trapped in this theology, this, this would be a great resource to, uh, to be able to speak to them in love and truth and grace. Uh, we want to make sure we're, we're doing that. Uh, church, some... some different resources that you can take. These are the two books I talked about, Charismatic Chaos and Strange Fire. I have both of them on Kindle, I think, so I don't know if I can share them with you, but uh, those are good. If you want to just learn more about the Trinity, if you think this doctrine confuses me and I would love to learn more, Simply Trinity by Matthew Barrett is, uh, is a really, really good, accessible uh, look at that. And then Cultish, I talked about this before this podcast. Uh, they have a five-part series on the UPC. So if you're looking and you say, I've got five hours, and I would love to spend some time getting in depth with a survivor uh, a, a survivor of this cult, uh, it is great. I listened to the first two. I didn't have five hours, so I had two hours to, to give to it. But um, it, is, it is really, really good. And she paints a really scary picture about being imprisoned in a, in a place that's very difficult for her to leave. So um, that, that is the UPC. Uh, Again, I, I told you, I think this is one of the more dangerous ones. I think it's easy to identify it like a, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. I, I think it'd be easy to identify where, where the points of theology are, are drastically different. But here, man, it, they wrap everything in, in. Like, I watched a sermon this week, and I'll say I didn't disagree with anything that he said. And that, that scares me, because then what it takes is years of listening and saying, that doesn't sound right. Like that, 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 what he said there. Now, if they get up and teach on oneness theology, which they will do, then, then you can look at it. But I watched through 30 minutes of a sermon, and there was not one point where I said, that was, that was heresy. 
So that's why I feel like this is so dangerous. You can visit a church. Many of them now will not have this name, UPC, on, on their church. Many of them are, are switching like many other churches are to be called Catalyst Church or Truth Church or, you know, uh, usually you see a church like that, a non-denominational church. No, not, not truly non-denominational. Denominational ninjas. They're, they're, they're hiding their true nature. A lot of times they're Baptists in disguise or, or Charismatics in disguise, but a lot of them now are, are UPC in disguise. So you got to... Buried on their website somewhere. Yes. And that's usually one of the first things you see in their statement of faith. They'll say something to the effect of, we believe, and, and you'll, you'll see that oneness. You'll see the word oneness uh, as, 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 a, as a description. You see that it's not, it's not, that's not an Orthodox church. It's not a church that I, I, would, I would touch with a nine and a half foot pole. So, yes, sir? My niece goes to, it's kind of a non-denominational assembly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they believe in the, the Trinity and a lot of things, but their big thing is is the tongues. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved, but you, you, when you do, you reach the higher level than everybody else. Right. And it just crushes my my knees because she can't she can't speak in tongues. I said they don't have nothing to do it. They don't have nothing to do with being saved. I said they Which, just do that to try to show. Make themselves look better to yes. other people. Because I said, if you listen, it almost all sounds the same, yep. and nobody's interpreting it. It's just they just up there. And that's that's. I mean, biblically, Paul says he gave space for for tongues, yeah. but I also believe it was in a different dispensation. I think yeah. it was in a different time. But he gave space for tongues with the caveat: there must be an interpreter. Yeah. There, there. It must be a message that's going to benefit the church. Now, what you're talking about, that is called Gnosticism. It's a false gospel. It's a false theology called Gnosticism, yeah. where there is entry-level Christianity, and then there's deeper teachings that only a select few are privileged enough to, to enjoy. Yeah. That was, that was a, a, many of the, the writers of epistles wrote to combat Gnosticism. Yeah. Yes, sir? I'm just wondering, how do they select their, their pastors? If, if the pastor is going to be the one that's in charge of all mm -hmm. this, how, how, do they, how do they get that? Is it sent from someone above, like in the Methodist church now that... Right, the hierarchy. No, they, they choose their own pastors, and many times you will see that one pastor has several protégés. So it's not uncommon. They, they have these things called, I want to say, points of study, and they're not Bible colleges, because they do have six big Bible colleges, but they're little points of study where a pastor can train lay people, and, and credential them as ministers, and they have three different levels of ministering. They have local ministers, and they can do anything in the local church. They can preach, um, but they cannot baptize, and they cannot perform a wedding, but they can preach. And then there's another level of, of regional where you can do certain things, and then there's the credential fully licensed where you can do it all. You can be a, a, a full minister. So, but you, it's not uncommon to see one pastor with four or five guys that he is, that he is training and he is, so I, I think it's their network. I think that's how they, you know, the, the, our church needs a pastor and one guy says, hey, I, I have four or five ministers that I'm training, here's him, and I think it's, that's how it goes. But obviously that one man who had, who had hurt that girl came back to that same church and they gave him a position there. And they gave him with. I mean, they told. They didn't tell the congregation, but they, it was in the in the court deposition that that pastor said, "I just made sure he wasn't around kids," and that was sufficient for him to say he could preach in the church. Which on their official website, they would say you you will never be credentialed after an accusation or after being accused of that. But that's not how it's practiced. Although I will say this, I think every church has abusers. And I think it's it's important for a church to look and understand what you constantly test leadership against. First uh, Timothy three and uh, Titus chapter one, and look and say, are are these people who they say they are? And 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 I think it's important to constantly keep them in check, myself included. So, but yeah, I don't know how they choose, but they the, the congregations are autonomous, so they can they can they have the right to. Hire and release their their pastors. Any other questions? Go look them up. It's real interesting. There's more that can be said. 
um, be wary. There's wolves everywhere, and they want nothing more than to. Satan wants nothing more than to disrupt, distract, and destroy God's people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we 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 call out to you as as our Father through the name of Jesus and with the the empowerment of the Spirit knowing that there are people in our community that are trapped in this. There are people right now sitting at home or, or maybe at a church, and, and they are part of this church. I pray, Lord, that you would do the work that only you can do and draw your true church, draw your people out of, of these groups, these, these churches that are, Lord, just fostering abuse and sending people to hell. I pray that you would give us the courage to stand up and say, when we know something is wrong. Lord, I pray that you give us the, the doctrinal clarity and courage to uh, defend our faith and defend what Scripture teaches, that you are Trinity and we worship you as Father, Son, and Spirit at the same time, co-eternal, co-existing. Lord, we, we praise you for that. We may not understand every detail, but we praise you and we know that your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts higher than our thoughts, and we are given the glorious promise that one day we will see you face to face and we will know you and we'll have our questions answered and so we anticipate that day with joy father we love you and i thank you for every person in here i pray that you would equip us with gospel truth to fight against what satan has has in store for the people in our community and in our families give us courage uh, give us truth lord ground us in, and uh, anchor us in the truth of jesus christ and his gospel we love you lord and we thank you for this time that we spent in your word it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray these things. Amen.